January 9, 2007, San Francisco, California, mere minutes before he put Sneaker to stage for the biggest keynote in history. Steve Jobs, Apple's co-founder, called his team together and told them to remember this moment, this one last moment before the iPhone, before everything was gonna change. And it all almost never happened at all because Steve Jobs never intended for Apple to make the iPhone. He was just having dinner one day with his wife, her friend, and her friend's husband, who just so happened to be working at Microsoft, Apple's biggest rival. And the dude was going on and on about how Bill Gates was gonna revolutionize the whole entire world with a breakthrough new product, the tablet PC, digital pen and paper. And Steve went from eye rolling to full on kill mode so fast because there are few motivators in this world better than competition, but spite is absolutely one of them. And there was just no way in hell Steve Jobs was gonna let Microsoft, janky, tasteless Microsoft, redefine the future of ultra-personal computing. Not on his watch, no sir. So Apple began to work on what would eventually become the iPad. Yes, the iPad, but stick with me. Because Shyamalan style plot twist, at the exact same time, the smartphone revolution was just beginning. Handspring and Palm, Blackberry and Nokia. It was still very early days and they were all equal parts tantalizing and terrible. And to Steve Jobs and his team, they all kind of just sucked. But here's the thing. It was also clearly, absolutely clearly an existential threat like meteors to dinosaurs or Facebook to civilization. Not a threat to the Mac, not for a long time to come, but likely an extinction level event for Apple's other big business, the iPod. See, a thousand songs in your pocket is hella cool, and Apple was flat out dominating the MP3 market, but a thousand songs on your phone, that was gonna be way, way cooler, and basically game over for the iPod. And Steve Jobs, well, Steve was never one to mistake his company's products for its business. He'd seen what fear and protectionism was doing to Microsoft with Windows, and if anyone was gonna kill the iPod, it was damn well gonna be Apple. So they ran this proof of concept with Motorola called the Rocker. It was a way to test not just iTunes on a phone, but to learn more about making phones. And at the same time, they pivoted the tablet project, that Microsoft spiting tablet project, into a full-on Apple phone. It was codenamed Purple Experience Project, or more commonly, just Purple. And the dream was for it to be based on this multi-touch technology Apple had acquired from Fingerworks, but that was being prototyped as a massive table-sized rig, nothing even close to what could fit into a pocket to what Steve could actually sell. So he decided to split the team up. Tony Fidel, who'd been working on the iPod, would lead Purple One, or P1, an iPod-based phone with a click wheel interface. I kid you not. Something Apple could bring to market just way more rapidly, way faster, and buy time for Purple 2, or P2, led by Scott Forstall, who'd been working on OS X, and would be the follow-up, the multi-touch Mac phone. Now, secrecy for Purple was dialed up to 11, 111. Steve insisted on disclosing each and every new addition to the team personally, something made hugely complicated by his growing health issues. So managers had to get creative, running to secured rooms to look at whiteboards, back to rooms filled with undisclosed new recruits, basically the worst Mr. Beast challenge ever, just doing their best to describe what needed to be implemented and how. But then, then something super interesting began to happen. As much as there was an external rivalry between Apple and Microsoft, and unbeknownst to any of them yet, Palm and Blackberry, there was a growing internal rivalry between P1 and P2. See, Fidel's team really wanted to finish and ship fast, but Forrestal's team began beating them to key critical milestones like SMS, the texting system used on all mobile phones. The nail in P1's coffin though, was the multi-touch interface that P2 was developing, especially human interface designer Baz Ording's inertial scrolling and rubber banding lists that would slow down the way a spinner would in real life and wouldn't just stop cold or feel stuck, but bounce back at the ends. A type of digital faux physics that didn't just make P2 feel better and more instinctive to use, but way more fun to use. When Steve saw that, when he realized that, it was second purple to the right and straight ahead till keynote. Because it was all just coming together, this 
perfect combination of everything Apple had been learning about miniaturization from the iPod, media content and syncing that they'd built out over the last few years for iTunes, the foundation of Next and OS X that they'd spent so much time transitioning Apple to, the growth of mobile carriers and especially mobile data, and AT&T's, then Singular's, rabid desperation to catch up to Verizon. Verizon who'd been offered the Apple phone before and just hard passed, like the hardest of passes. But that let Apple keep P2 secret even from the carriers, even from Singular, and more critically, free from their meddling, their constant molestation, something that had frustrated and compromised the attempts of literally every other phone maker. There were real problems though. The keyboard, for one, Palm, Nokia, and Blackberry had been using full-on hardware keyboards, which were terrifically tactile, but to Apple, just maddeningly immutable. A software keyboard that could change, not just over time, but from app to app and experience to experience, was going to be critical to Steve's marketing, but it was just a complete failure at the time. So, Forstall stopped everything, called the team together, and had everyone go off and brainstorm a way to solve for that keyboard. Ken Kashinda won the Derby a few weeks later with an implementation that would change the tap target size for the individual characters depending on what you were typing, larger for more likely combinations, way smaller for less likely. Also, autocorrect, which would try to fix anything that didn't come out right right away, even if it often made things just way more wrong, ducking hilariously wrong. But it took so long to nail that keyboard there was just no time left to work on advanced text functions like, oh, copy and paste. Another temple was gonna be the first real web browser on mobile. Don Melton had led the Alexander project, the one that had forked KDE's KHTML rendering engine and Conqueror browser from Linux into WebKit and Safari for OS X. It had the advantage of a code base that was just ridiculously small, so small it could fit onto a phone. Richard Williamson was in charge of bringing Mobile Safari to P2, but this time it didn't go badly. It went way, way too well. So well, Apple never even bothered making a WAP browser, one of those stripped down little barely functional wireless access protocol browsers, AKA baby web browsers that every other phone was relying on at the time. But too late, Apple discovered they needed WAP to support MMS, the multimedia version of SMS, you know, the protocol that lets you display things like pictures in text message threads. So they'd have to ship without that as well. And there were also bigger issues ahead of them, like whether to build the interface with AppKit, the traditional frameworks on the Mac or WebKit and go all in on web-based technologies or to create something entirely new. And they'd eventually settle on something pretty new, kind of new, UIKit. But there wasn't any time to even think about an SDK or Software Developers Kit. Ari Lamoureux's entire Frameworks team was already running a marathon of sprints. Forstall was even hacking together basic controls for views and tables. But they had planned to ship some of the built-in apps using those web technologies, specifically the kind they debuted as dashboard widgets on the Mac. Apps like Weather, but the performance was just terrible. So terrible they had to switch them over to native code, and that pretty much settled that, at least at Apple. Steve would also sometimes just change his mind, like deciding he hated the split screen email view Nitin Ganatra's app team had been working on. So that got yoded. But he was also brokering deals with Google to add even more apps. Their then CEO, Eric Schmidt, was on Apple's board, but kinda sorta forgot to ever tell Steve they were also working on Android at the exact same time. But that story of intrigue and double betrayal is for another video. Let me know if you want to see it. Either way, Apple would have access to Google services like Maps and soon YouTube as well. But Apple would have to design and build their own apps and interfaces for those services from scratch, which added to the already just staggering load. It wasn't too bad when Forstall was around. He had this singular talent, this ability to just know which three out of a hundred of any particular design or implementation Steve would like enough to make a final call on. But whenever Forstall was busy doing something else and not around to effectively precognate for a designer or engineer, the iteration cycles on which specific shade of blue or what exact texture could be near endless. Because Steve didn't want P2 to feel antiseptic. He believed photorealism not only made tables and lists less naked and more visually interesting, but more relatable and distinguishable to actual people the human side of human interface. Industrial design had to face some grim realities as well. Johnny Ives' platonic ideal aluminum slab 
was being cut off at the knees by a plastic kilt just so Bob Mansfield's hardware team could ensure there'd be enough radio transparency for the GSM voice and 2G edge data signals and 802.11 BG Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 2.0 EDR for all of that to pass through. But there also wasn't even 3G UTMS HSPA data, AT&T's faster, better, longer, stronger network. Hell, AT&T's 2G network wasn't in any shape to support what the iPhone would become much less they're still maturing, still being rolled out 3G network. Also no GPS, just Wi-Fi router mapping and cell tower triangulation. The industrial design team also had this long standing urge to kill the headphone jack, kill it just to watch it die. Luckily for the vast majority of us, that was just nowhere nearly ready to become a reality yet, especially not with the Bluetooth Apple had to work with at the time. So they begrudgingly drilled into the bead blasted aluminum shell so they could fit the super skinny hipster plug on Apple's headphone jacks. The main port was Apple's 30 pin dock connector. That would tie P2 into the whole entire iPod ecosystem, giving it a huge advantage over every other phone on the market where it mattered most to Apple, mainstream consumers. They did add a ringer switch though. The industrial design team hated buttons almost as much as headphone jacks, but no one, and I mean absolutely no one, wanted it to be their phone that interrupted Steve during a meeting. I kid, kinda. But the basic principle was something like, if 80% of the people don't use it 80% of the time, it shouldn't be built in. But that's also exactly why Apple added a physical home button. So anyone not as technologically savvy, anyone who felt lost or confused could just push that button at any time, like an escape hatch, and return instantly to the comfortably known state of the home screen and its springboard of app icons. That was gonna be key to making P2 feel accessible to the far, far broader market. Apple also had these sensors that had to be perfectly calibrated to really sell the whole experience. Not just the multi-touch, which was actually a three-dimensional radiating field that some other companies would later dabble with for things like air gestures, but that Apple settled on early on as a way to model far more precise finger detection and rejection, but also an accelerometer that had to automatically rotate the screen to match device orientation, and a proximity sensor that had to automatically switch off the display and the multi-touch system when you held it close to your face. That display, by the way, was 3.5 inches, the biggest display they could fit into a phone at the time. Even if by today's standards, it's tiny, toy sized it could ride a Pro Max like a Tauntaun. And it was all powered by an ARM-based 1176 JZFS processor, PowerVR MBX Lite 3D graphics chip, and 128 megabytes of RAM manufactured by Samsung, literally repurposed from a set-top box. But Apple was just beginning to look ahead to assemble their Silicon Avengers. Tim Ouellette was already on board, but Johnny Ceruji was still on his way because they knew even back then that it would become one of their single biggest differentiators from GPU accelerated rock solid 60 frames per second animations to instant touch response for direct manipulation and just so, so much more to come. Famously, very late in the process, Steve managed to scratch up the then plastic screen of his prototype with his keys. And so he demanded something harder and Apple's hardware team and Corning had to just race to get chemically hardened ion exchange glass ramped up and ready for production lines in mere weeks. And of course, because P2 was based on OS X, Apple's native apps would have killer multitasking capabilities. And Steve really wanted to show those off. Start a song, make a call, switch to mail, look up something in Safari, end the call and have the music just fade perfectly back in. Something that second only to pinch to zoom would drop every jaw in the room. But for the demo, things were still just MacGyvered together with so many paper clips and chewing gum that it would only work if Steve stuck to that exacting sequence of tasks, to that golden path and any deviation or any bad luck and it would all come crashing down around him. It was also gonna be priced at 499 for the four gigabytes and 599 for the eight gigabytes model on contract. Those prices weren't unheard of at the time Early Motorola Razr flip phones were incredibly expensive back in the day as well, but it meant P2 would be limited to early adopters and those willing and able to pay a premium, a far cry from the mainstream audience the iPod had reached. Then there was a small, tiny really issue of Cisco owning the trademark for the name Steve Jobs and Apple had settled on for P2, the iPhone, something that might've stalled or even altered the plans of any company not run by Steve Jobs who decided he was just gonna roll with it, 
hope for a nat 20 and not a fumble to force a deal later and not just get mired down in litigation now. Because January 9th, 2007 was set. The keynote had to be beyond epic. It had to be iconic. And of course it was. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. Today, today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The original iPhone would go on to sell 6 million units in its first year on four carriers and in four countries, but it would soon sell hundreds and hundreds of millions on almost every carrier, on almost every corner of Earth, and to change not only the world, but so many of our lives. And I've got a whole entire documentary up on how it affected me, but also MKBHD, iJustine, John Gruber, and so many more. It was like CES was a distant memory. Everyone knew that we had never seen anything like this ever before. That's 100% going to be where everyone goes. And you can watch it right now exclusively on Nebula. That's the streaming video service by creators, for creators, where I post all of my videos, including extended versions of my interviews, reviews, and explainers, and where I have the luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube, but where I just know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will absolutely love them, and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or click the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on holiday sale for 42% off, less than 12 bucks a year, less than the price of a fancy bistro burger for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Top Science Stories of 2021, which brings you all the amazing news-breaking advances in science and technology this year. Startling discoveries from around the globe, from a prehistoric nursery to a healthcare treatment breakthrough, basically an exclusive hype tour from Earth to space. It is the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and pretty much the best damn deal on streaming today. For over 42% off CuriosityStream, less than $12 a year, and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Richie. Clicking on that button really helps out this channel and so does hitting up the playlist above for more, much more on everything Apple has coming our way in 2022. Just hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.